Okay, open up your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel according to John. We had a great event on Friday night. The Foster Family Night went really well. Thank you, those who volunteered and were part of that. I believe that there was 40 kids and a lot of families that were blessed through that. If you're using one of our church Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 4. It's page 1061. It's helpful, right? Uh, if you're using your own Bible, you're on your own. Uh, I'm using the New American Standard Version, probably easiest to follow along. You know, our mission here at Calvary is to communicate God's love and plan for people and to make disciples through his word. And this is what we're doing every Sunday. We're opening up the word. And that rolls into our vision statement that we'd be responding, people responding to the gospel, living freedom that's found in the gospel, and then growing in the grace that is rooted in the gospel. So this is what we're doing. Respond, live, grow. I've titled this message here in John 4, Blessings of Belief. We're going to see that there are many references to believing, and we're going to see the blessings of believing. In our last time together, we were in the first part of John 4. I've split this up into two-part message, and we were reading in that, in that whole interaction that Jesus had with the woman at the well. And as we entered that, and we were doing an intro to that chapter, we were comparing and contrasting the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and this woman at the well in John chapter 4. And it was kind of interesting compare and contrast as we looked at his conversation that he had with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Nicodemus being a, a religious man, someone who was honored by their culture, honored by the religious system. And then in John 4, Jesus talks with this woman at the well. This would have been an immoral woman that we've noted here, and she was, would have been despised by the religious system. In John chapter 3, we saw Nicodemus was this calm contemplator. As we looked last time together in, in John 4, we saw the woman was more of a, a fiery debater. And then in, in John 3, we saw that Jesus speaks with Nicodemus in the cool of the night. And then he speaks here in John 4 with the woman in the heat of the day. And then we see that Nicodemus initiated that conversation with Jesus in John 3. And here Jesus he initiates a conversation with the woman at the well. And I just point that out because it's just really cool. As we have this opportunity, as we're going through the gospel according to John, as we, we just get lots of Jesus. And this teaches us and shows us who Jesus is. And I just love that passage in Hebrews that talks about that Jesus is the very character, he's the very uh, nature, he's the radiance, he's the exact representation of God. And so we can come to know our creator God by knowing our Savior Jesus. And so it's just beautiful as we take opportunities to make these observations. And I, and I point that out to say that between that conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus and this conversation that he had with the woman at the well, it just shows us that Jesus cares about people. And I made the statement last week that, that Jesus meets people where they're at because he cares. But because he cares, he doesn't leave them where they're at. He invites them into change. And so both with Nicodemus and both with the woman at the well. I love that. And there they are. Jesus and this woman, they're standing at this physical well, and Jesus is laying down spiritual truths. He invites this woman into this abundant life, this eternal life, and they're going back and forth about water versus living water. Look back at chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus makes a statement here. Talking about this this water and this well and the living water. Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Our last time together, I... I Talk about this idea that, you know, sometimes this is a, a lofty concept 
or it seems mystical. And this idea of accepting the living water that Jesus has for you to embrace the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and it is a lofty idea, and in some ways it is a bit mystical, but it is a correct idea. And it's theologically correct, but sometimes I think where we struggle is where is the practical in it? You might say, well, it's great. You know, this, I want the living water that Jesus has. I want that Holy Spirit that is the promise. And, and yet, how is it that I'm still thirsty? So the question becomes, how do we quench this thirst? If, if it's not the things of the world that quench our thirst if it's not possessions, if it's not relationships, if it's not status that quench our thirst, then how do we satisfy this thirst through this idea of the living water and the work of the Holy Spirit? I believe it to be very practical and very simple. And I ended with our message last week with this, uh, this practical look at this. I believe that by reading your Bible, and praying every day that you're going to satisfy the thirst that is in your soul. Reading your Bible and praying every day. This is this idea that Jesus brought up with spirit and truth. It's taking Jesus at his word. That's the truth. And then it's walking by the spirit, reading your Bible and praying every day, asking the Holy Spirit to give you conviction and then as the Holy Spirit gives you conviction, you ask the Lord to help you with that conviction, with your repentance and your obedience to that conviction. And that'd be walking in the truth. And so if you're reading your Bible and you're praying every day, and, and I'm not talking, you don't have to, this, this is what's amazing, you know, the, how God has created us. There, let me give you an example. Ben and I have completely different palates for coffee. It, it's so funny. He'll get so fired up about this coffee. You've got to try this coffee. This is the best coffee. This is the best blend ever. And he'll want to, can I make you a latte? And he makes it. And I've learned now to not, to just reject it because <laughs> I don't like it. And then I feel bad that I'm hurting his feelings. But, but then we figured it out. I'm like, hey, it's not you. It's me. You know, we have a different palate. Your reading ability could be different. The way that you take in God's word. You may be the type of person that you need, you need one verse and boy, you're going to chew on that all day. Or you need a chapter. Or you need a section of scripture. There's not a formula, but reading your Bible every day and praying every day. Maybe you need a completely un, you know, I, I get distracted very easy. I don't know how, I got, I've got pastor friends that go to the Starbucks and they write their sermons at the Starbucks. I'm like, how do you do that? I'm like ADD, I'm like, look at that car. Oh, what's that person doing? Ooh, why'd they order that? That's kind of weird. What is, is that the new style? What is, I mean, they, did they cut their hair that way on purpose? I mean, you know, I'm not getting anything done. I, I need, focus. But maybe you can pray in public and read your Bible in public. Go for it. Read your Bible and pray every day. I believe this is where we're going to find our true satisfaction. And remember, Jesus was the one that he invited you know, this to, to come to him. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. The, the weary, heavy laden things, that, that's going to the wells of this earth. That's going to the, the wells of this earth to, to draw out this, this heavy thing that won't truly satisfy. It's like that I, you know, I brought up that warm Coke. It just doesn't do it. So the word, prayer, following convictions, this is going to lead you to that abundant life that Jesus promised. And he told us that the thief, the enemy, your adversary, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to undermine your relationship with, with the Lord Jesus. He says, I have come. You may have life and have it abundantly. And so that kind of life that Jesus wants us to walk in, this abundant life, I think in a very practical sense, if we would commit ourselves to his word, 
commit ourselves to, to regular prayer. And then as the Holy Spirit brings conviction, that we would respond to that conviction and that we would repent and walk in obedience. That, that's where it's at. That's the living water. That's where the power comes. So it just gets, this is the spirit and truth. Jesus said in, in chapter 4 here, verse 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Let's pray that we're going to continue here. Father God, we thank you for this Lord, I believe that you've made it practical for us. Forgive us, Lord, when we have complicated things. God, I pray now as we turn our attention to your word, your truth, that by your spirit that we could have understanding. And God, if there is points of conviction, Lord, that we'd respond to that conviction in obedience and that we'd, we'd, we would repent and turn towards you God, give us clarity through your word this morning. Thank you for all that has happened up to this point with the worship and fellowship. Bless us now, Lord, we pray. And Lord God, we do lift up Israel in this mess over there. Father God, we, we pray for Israel, Lord, as your word tells us to. God, we pray for peace. Lord, your word says, if it is possible that you would have... The, would walk in peace. So, Lord, we do pray for peace. We pray for clarity in this. Give us discernment as we look at the world events. God, that we would look at them with a, a biblical worldview. Help us with that, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We left off in our last time together with Jesus' mic drop statement. You remember that? You know, Jesus is talking about all of these things, this living water, and this water that he has to offer to, up to eternal life. And then, and then he talks about, you know, he, he brought up some conviction in this woman's life about this, these husbands, and the, the one she's living with now isn't her husband. And she's like, rightly so, you're a prophet, but let's change the subject. Let's talk about where we're supposed to worship. And she gets into this theological debate, it seems like, you know, you guys say you worship in Jerusalem. Our people say we worship here. Where are we supposed to worship? And then and Jesus, uh, you know, he, he cuts through all this and, he, and he's, he's trying to show her and he's describing that it's going to be true worship is one who worships in spirit and truth. And she says, this is all great. It's a little bit confusing. But when the Messiah comes, he's going to bring clarity. And then that's when, you know, he, that's what she says right there in verse 25. I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when, he, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with the woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And they went out of the city and were coming to him. So Jesus declares, I am he who you speak of. Basically, I am the Messiah. And she leaves her water pot and goes and tells other about Jesus. I love that picture. Jesus' words are so powerful to her, so transformative to her, that she had to tell others. You know, I don't think we can make too much of why she left her water pot, but I think it's something to take note of. You know, maybe she didn't, it didn't, she didn't want it to slow her down as she went back into the city. Maybe she knew that she was going to come back and continue in this conversation with Jesus, so she wasn't worried about it. Maybe in her excitement uh, with this revelation of Jesus, the, the Christ, and remember, the physical concerns of this life were not a high priority. Maybe she wanted to leave Jesus with something. Remember that he said to, you know, can you draw me some water? And, and, and then he offers to give her water, and she's like, you have nothing with you. Maybe she wanted to leave him something uh, that he could get some water. Whatever it may be, we can say that the words of Jesus and his invitation to her changed her. And it was so impactful that she had to tell others. You remember when you first got saved? 
when you first really experience God's love for you, or realize that God's grace was for you, that you were so excited about that, you just had to tell others. And the nuances of this life, they just weren't as important. And so she goes and she goes and tells the men from the city about Jesus. She, she simply says, verse 29, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. Is this not the Christ? They went out of the city and were coming to him. It, it seems like there would be more to the message she delivered, but we don't know. Whatever it was, it was effective because the men from the city do come out. But I like what John writes here in her model of evangelism. I met Jesus. He knew me. You got to come see him. Can you do that? Is that that difficult? I met Jesus. He knew me. You got to come see him. She shares her testimony. She invites him, them, them to meet Jesus, invites them to hear his word. And so obviously this is an effective message because they start to make their way out to see this guy. And it says in verse 31, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say that there are four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Something that we have observed with Nicodemus and even the woman at the well and something that, that the disciples, we often see with them is, and I believe that we ourselves do, I know I do, is their concerns were of the physical. Jesus' concerns were of the spiritual. And so the things that he was saying, the things that he was teaching, the emphasis that he was making were on the spiritual. And often people would miss it because they were focused on the physical. Rabbi, you need to eat. It's time for lunch. <laughs> and Jesus says, I have food that you don't know about. The disciples looking around, it was probably Peter that said, you know, what did somebody bring him, a lamb shawarma or something? <laughs> he says in verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. See, Jesus had found true satisfaction. He found satisfaction, he found energy in doing the will of God and accomplishing the ministry that God had called him into. This is truly satisfying. When you're exercising your gifts and your talents for God's glory, you know, when you're being involved in, in furthering God's kingdom, it is energizing. To, to walk in the, the works, as Ephesians 2.10 says, that, that God has equipped you to walk, to do these works that he prepared beforehand, you know, that you just walk in them. It really is satisfying, energizing, energizing. I think if you caught the report back on Wednesday night, last Wednesday night we had the Mission Lake Stevens team sharing about their testimony of being on the mission trip and the different things they were doing. And they worked really hard. And it wasn't the greatest conditions and sleep wasn't really an abundant thing and yet they were full of energy they're just running around it's a good place to be and I believe it comes from being empowered and filled by the Holy Spirit and serving from an overflow exercising the gifts and talents that God has given you as we're filled with the Spirit and we serve with an overflow, 
in the gifts and talents that God has given us. It is truly energizing. And, and Jesus recognized this. He experienced this, and he invites the disciples to take part of this. He says in verse 35, Do you not say that there are four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. This was apparently uh, some saying, you know, this four months to harvest. It's the idea that, you know, you plant a seed and then you know that in about four months there's going to be a harvest. And Jesus says, look up, guys. It's time for harvest. You know, it's interesting because... You imagine the scene, they're at, they're at a distance, some distance from the city at the community well there, Jacob's well, and he looks up and he sees these Samaritan men coming from the city to meet him. You know what the Samaritans wore? Their typical garments? It was white tunics with, with white uh, turbans. And so you get this idea that these guys are walking through the fields and they may have looked like you know, ripe cotton plant plants or some other harvest crop ready to be, you know, some crop ready to be harvested. And then Jesus, here we see here, Jesus points out the fact that the disciples had done nothing to prepare this harvest. This was a work of God. God, through his Holy Spirit, had prepared this harvest, and they were going to be take part of this. I really believe this points to this work of the Holy Spirit in the, you know, people coming to Christ and this whole harvest of people. Remember that the disciples were invited from their vocation that they had. Jesus said, you know, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And so there's going to be this harvest thing that was going to happen that they were being invited to. He says, verse 36, already he who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for life eternal. So that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. You know, as followers of Christ, we need to be ready for the harvest. We're involved in sowing process, planting the seed of the gospel. We may be involved in the watering, but we need to be ready for the harvest. And ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit. It's God who brings the conviction. He does the heavy lifting. And sometimes I think that we, we may take on more than we should, or we make too much of what we can do in our strength of maybe being a more powerful communicator or a more powerful debater. But at the end of the day, really, God does this work. And, and the beauty is, you know, it's our job just to share the message. And maybe we're involved with the sowing. Maybe we're, we get to water it. You don't know. Or sometimes we get involved with the harvest. And we're trusting God with the results. I think it's so interesting how Jesus points out here that the disciples here are going to be involved in a harvest that they did not work. I think about all the different opportunities. You just don't know. You just don't know. As you plant seeds, you know, and you share the gospel or you share your testimony, how that's going to have an impact and where that's going to go. And we've had this experience, you know, where people, I was sharing with a, a brother I had lunch with on Friday that, I've done so much ministry work here and planted so many seeds and watered so much and I've seen them go off to other areas in the country or other churches and then be really fruitful and I kind of like man that was I labored hard for that but I'm not really enjoying the fruit but then people show up here that people have labored into them and I'm benefiting the fruit of someone else's labor at the end of the day this is God's thing I think of uh, 1 Corinthians Paul writes about this I have this for the screen. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. It says, What then is Apollos, and what is Paul, servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, 
but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Planting, watering, harvesting. Sometimes I think the harvest is unexpected. I I think certainly for the disciples, from their perspective, this is an unexpected harvest. Remember that they were in Samaria, and we talked about this in our last time together, that they're with a group of people that their culture rejected. They're with a group of people that are hostile to them. And yet Jesus says, look up, you guys. The harvest is here. And this is challenging to me. Because to think about the possible harvest around me, that can go unnoticed, whether I'm focused on lunch, I like food, I think a lot about food, I like to plan out what's going to be for dinner, after breakfast is over I'm thinking about what are we going to do for lunch? And sometimes in the physical distractions of life can miss the harvest opportunity. Rabbi, you need to eat. You need to eat. We can make a big argument for that, right? You need food. You need need calories. You need protein. So you can continue the ministry. Sometimes I miss the harvest around me because I've disqualified people. Maybe through my own prejudice or my own, you know, position or, or um, view of people, or I assume that, oh, they're not going to want to hear it, or they're not interested in God. And I make these assumptions. When God could be breaking through, God could be bringing conviction, and I got to look up and there's the harvest, and all I got to do is be a part of this work that God has already labored to do. Something to think about. I actually put this, this is one of your life group questions for the week, that you can work this out with your group and maybe consider these unexpected harvests. Well, look at the result. Verse 39, from the city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all things that I have done. Verse 40, so then the Samaritan came to Jesus They were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. I love that. They have heard for themselves and believed. Isn't that beautiful? The woman's testimony had sparked an interest into Jesus. It drew them to Jesus. And so then they heard from Jesus for themselves, and then they made their faith their own. They were no longer dependent upon the woman's testimony, the woman's faith, but they made their faith their own. This is something that we've spent, you know, over the years... I often will talk with the youth about this, how important it is to have a personal conviction and a personal relationship with the Lord. A lot of the times, a a child will rely upon their parents' faith or their grandparents' faith or their church's faith or maybe their youth pastor or their pastor's faith. and, and, And they believe because someone important in their life believes, but they have not made it their own. And that faith will only take them so far. It can lead them to Jesus. It can lead them to the Word. But when the true trials and the temptations come in this life, it's not enough. You need to make, you need to take Jesus at His Word for yourself. To have a personal relationship with Christ, to have a personal conviction that Jesus is the Christ. And then this is where the blessings of belief really come alive. I just love that line in verse 42. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. To personally know and believe Jesus as the Savior of the world. They believe Jesus at his word. 
There doesn't seem to be any great signs or wonders. There, there's no miracles recorded, and yet it says that they believed. And this will be in contrast, we'll see as we continue here, to other areas. Verse 43, it says that after the two days, he went forth from there into Galilee. This is the idea that Jesus' and disciples spent two nights. The idea that they spent two nights there would have been a shocking thing to a religious Jew. They would have shared meals together with them. They would have spent, no doubt, somewhere in one of their homes. But it just reminds us that in God's eyes, there is no boundaries to grace. There is no room for racism or prejudices. And it probably spoke volumes to the Samaritans that Jesus would go there, that the Messiah would go and spend time with them. And so Jesus continues his journey north. We remember at the beginning of chapter 4, we saw that he was leaving Judea and he was going to Galilee and that he went the more direct route, which was uh, not the common thing for the Jew as he went through Samaria. He had intentions to go there. And then it says, verse 44, this kind of this odd statement, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. It's kind of interesting because he's heading back to Galilee, and I don't know if this is something that was just sort of said offhanded. It's hard to know if our author John meant it to associate with the place that, that Jesus was not honored in Judea or if it was Galilee. We do read in other Gospels, specifically about his time in Nazareth, how he was rejected. This, I have this for the, the screen. This is Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Mark 6, 3, at his time in Nazareth, it says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could not do he could do no miracle there except that he had laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief and he was going around the villages teaching. And so because of their unbelief, they missed the blessings. So the title is, there's blessings in belief. And so there's a kind of the contrast there of unbelief. They missed blessings. So as they head up north, it says in verse 45, when they came to Galilee. The Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. Therefore, he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine, and there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. So there seems to be a crowd here welcoming Jesus into the Galilee area, but it seems to be motivated on wanting more signs and wonders. I mean, the whole water and the wine business, they like that. <laughs> I like one commentator, he writes on this, he says, Signs and wonders from God are obviously good things, but they should not form the foundation of our faith. We should not depend on them to prove God to us. You know, in themselves, signs and wonders, they, they can't change the heart. Israel is a good example of this. They, in the wilderness, they heard God's voice. They saw great signs and wonders. And yet, we see them worshiping the golden calf. And so, not relying on signs and wonders. I think there's just something there that Jesus has put in here for us to take note of. Now, this royal official, he does demonstrate to us a belief that Jesus has the power to heal. This idea that he came from Capernaum to Canaan, this is about a 20-mile journey, and 99% of the travel of the time is going to be done on foot. So that's a bit of a distance, and we assume that he made this journey on foot in desperation for the healing of his son. And being labeled as the royal official, he actually was part of the Roman government. And here he is, recognizing that Jesus has the power to heal, and he pleads with Jesus to come and heal his son. 
And look what Jesus says to him. So verse 49, the royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. As he was now going down, his slave met him, saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives, and he himself believed, and his whole household. This is, again, a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. The first sign was at the happiest moment in the family's life, a wedding celebration, the water and the wine. The second sign is the saddest time for a family, the most difficult time for a family, when you have a sick child. Again, if we're observing Jesus, we just see that Jesus meets us. He meets you both in the joys of this life and in the sadness of this life. And notice here that the blessing of belief, Jesus tells him, your son lives, verse 50. Go, your son lives. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. I underlined this in my Bible. I think this is a good word right here. He believed and started off. He believed and he walked in his belief. By him going, by receiving the word of Jesus, it shows that he believed him. James speaks of this. I have this for the screen. James 2.18. James writes, But someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works. I will show you my faith by my works. And then he says in James 2.20, But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? I believe this to be challenging. Because if you truly believe God at his word, then you're going to walk in it. If you say you believe God and you say you believe his word, then you're going to walk in it. You have the word. Maybe you're holding it. Maybe you're looking at it right now. Do you believe this? Do you believe this is God's word? By faith, the father goes. Did you notice that he didn't go directly home that day? Verse 52. You know, he's on his way. The slaves meet him at verse 51. Verse 52, he inquired them at the hour when they began to get better, when his son began to get better, and they said to him, yesterday. At the seven hour, the fever left him. And so the father knew, verse 53, that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, it was yesterday. I don't know what to make of that. I don't know if it speaks to some great faith where he, Jesus said, my son's going to live. I'm going to go get a good night's sleep and then take the journey tomorrow. I'm not sure. But this confirmation of belief, I just love the result because it says that it was it was confirmed. So he took Jesus at his word and then by faith he went and, and in his obedience, by faith or in his faith, it gets confirmed. Look for confirmation of God's word. Look for confirmation of God's word. If you believe God's word and you're walking by faith in it, look for this bits of confirmation and let it strengthen your belief. Because God does bring confirmation, either through his word, worship, other Christians. He does bring confirmation. And so in this confirmation, his belief was strengthened. And then look at the result of verse 53. He himself believed, the father believed, and then the whole household believed. Dads, you have a huge impact on the faith of your family. Huge. I've been doing this long enough where when dads are strong in their faith, the family often follows the suit. Strong in faith. 
when dads are struggling, not walking in their faith, the family often struggles. It's not a 100%. It's a generalization. But it's an observation that I can make from 24 years of ministry experience. You have his word. The word says to cast your care upon him, to bring your needs to him, and then believe that he has the power to meet those needs. And then you walk in it. You walk in it. The Bible says to, that we walk by faith and not by sight. When Jesus told them, go, your son lives, he didn't have a FaceTime you know, he didn't whip out his, his iPhone and FaceTime his wife. How's the son doing? Great blessings in belief. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he started off. Let's, let's do that. Lots to think about this morning. Lots to consider. I hope I just filled you up. Go to your life groups this week. Work it out. Talk about it. If you're not in a life group, talk to your spouse. Talk to a friend. Father God, we thank you for this word this morning. We thank you for the conviction that your Holy Spirit brings. Lord God, help us to be aware of those unexpected harvests, the harvest opportunities around us. Forgive us, Lord, when we have been so focused on the physical that we've missed the spiritual. Open our eyes. Open our eyes, Lord, that we may look up and see what you're doing, where you're working. And God, that we may have the faith to walk as this father walked. Believe you at your word. Guide us by your Holy Spirit, we pray this week. In Jesus' name, amen.